Hello everybody, the big we play tournament ended a few days ago and man was it fun to watch. Firstly, we would like to congratulate Mago on his victory. His deck innovation and excellent play led him to first place, and we are excited to see his artifact career progress further. The tournament meta has never been so diverse. With the exception of red-green, plenty of different archetypes were visible. We play did a great job organizing the tournaments and the production and theming was exceptional. The casters were terrific and it truly was a culmination of the community's greats. The change of the format was also welcome. Being able to bring two decks instead of one solves the boring matchup issue that sometimes plagues Constructed, enabling a greater variety of viewing. There were so many great decks present that it's understandable if you didn't catch everything. That's why today, we wanted to showcase some of the more notable deck lists that players played in the top 16, providing a sort of snapshot of the tournament meta and the strategies therein. Here is a color breakdown of all the decks present in the top 16. As you can see, red was there nearly twice as much as the next color green. Red-green had the highest percentage of attendance, but that was expected leading in. The only color combinations not present was green-black and mono-black and green. So pretty diverse overall. 13 players brought red-green ramp as one of their decks. Each of them teched their deck to their own preference. However, most did not deviate from the norm. This being the usual hero lineup with the fifth rotating between being Lycan, Drow Ranger, or Omni Knight. Interestingly, three of the players added Darkseer as their fifth. We all know that Swim has been testing this card in his deck for days, but even he ultimately decided not to bring it to the playoffs. Even so, Darkseer was not the most surprising fifth hero we've seen. Mago, the winner of the tournament, put Abaddon instead, and it made for some great moments. A Phonic Shield can be used. How much damage does he go down to? He should still go down to 10 because of the Jasper Daggers. He'll have... So it'll be exact lethal. He'll have exact lethal. All right. Oh! He actually dies! Oh, I forgot about that! Oh my god, are you serious? A Phonic Shield! Abaddon just fit perfectly in this meta. His passive makes him damage immune, protecting him from cards like Duel, Gank, and damaging AoEs like at any cost. In fact, removal has become so rampant that everyone was looking for answers in the form of silence or initiative gaining cards. Mago instead decided to get to the core of the issue and added Abaddon to his deck. Abaddon's signature used to be very situational, but the increased prevalence of debuff cards has given this signature the additional uses it needed to excel. Playing Aphotic Shield on a hero with Viscous Nasal Goo not only removes the debuff, but also adds a buff on top of it for this round. It can also reduce the impact of Time of Triumph from your opponent's hero by removing the buffs the card gives. So if there's one thing to take away from this tournament, it's that we should probably give Abaddon another look. Here we got another version of Red Green Ramp from Stormlike. He put three Thunderhide Alphas in his deck, or as they are now dubbed, Thunder Chads, in the place of Emissary of the Quorum. An interesting choice. Sure, if the Alpha gets blocked by a small creep, all that damage goes to waste, but with the abundance of red-green and red-black midrange in the meta, I guess people couldn't go wide as much, enabling more situations where Alpha was able to hit the tower more often. The second most played archetype was Mono Red. It popped up at the start of the WePlay qualifiers and has become a powerhouse deck since. There were six players who brought it into top 16. All six were pretty similar in their lists, featuring Axe, Legion Commander, and Bristleback as usual. For the fourth and fifth hero spot, four red heroes were up for consideration. They were Beastmaster for his strong stats relative to other remaining options, Timbersaw for his board controlling signature card, Tidehunter for the initiative gain, and Centaur Warrunner to push damage to the tower or kill an opposing red hero easily with double edge. When picking, just try to pick the option that appeals the most to you, as they are currently pretty even in their output. When it comes to the main deck, they were pretty similar as well, with the variations being in the quantities of certain cards. Some creeps that competed for a slot were Marifel Brawler for its high health and Red Mist Pillager for its board flooding nature. The only interesting tech card seen was Routed, which was added in by Me God. Sure, Routed can be powerful when you hit multiple heroes in the fountain, but it is yet to be seen if it should be played on average. Hoey, who also ran the deck, had his mono red without Routed and managed to defeat Me God and place higher in the end. The third most common deck was Red-Black Midrange, a strategy that relies on midrange creep pressure like Tyler Estate Sensor and Stonehole Elite to always stay ahead on the board. Some versions even have access to cards like Hipfire and Chain Frost to steal initiative when they need to. There were four players who brought this archetype. The aforementioned three red heroes and Phantom Assassin were present in all. The fifth hero was the one up for debate. Possibilities included Lich to give you a powerful board clear that also provides initiative, Tinker for a board clear that could be played in any lane, or Sorla for her extra damage. 
The deck is pretty flexible in its main deck card choices, but the main idea is to rely on creep pressure and close out the game with Time of Triumph. Petrify brought the only true black-red aggro deck, meaning the only one that had both Sorla and Tinker. No Time of Triumph or Spring the Trap in the deck, but instead, three Disciple of Nevermore's three Mercenary Exiles and a copy of Untested Grunt to push the damage early on. March of the Machines, combined with Assault Ladders, helps to pump large amounts of damage to the tower. The rest of the deck lines up with a normal red-black midrange build. Next on the list, we have Red with a Splash of Black, Midrange. We see 4 to 1 ratio decks being tested a lot, but we haven't seen it do well in tournaments until now. We first saw Vin Kelsier bring Rix to mix in with his mono blue to surprisingly potent results. But now we have this version that Shauna and Mago played that took them to finals. This itself should prove the deck's viability. The pitch of a 4 to 1 ratio deck is the consistency of a monocolor deck with the select power picks of a complementary color. In this particular instance, you get coup de grace and multi lane removal cards like Gank and Pick Off that aren't available for red. With only one black hero, there are mostly multi-lane cards, so you can still get the impact of that color, even if they are not present in that lane. Both of the decks seen in the tournament are very similar. Shauna has two copies of Mercenary Exiles, whereas Mago has one enough magic, two Red Mist Pillager, and Lodestone Demolition. Lodestone Demolition is another up-and-coming card that served as anti-Time of Triumph tech, so much so that some players opted to not cast Time of Triumph as to not offer a free 12 damage to their tower. Bays brought black blue aggro, this being the same archetype that Petrify brought to the group stage and made it to top 16 with. Bays decided to remove the hip fires from the deck and opted for two trebuchets with some minor changes to the items. Petrify ultimately decided to opt out of this deck for top 16 to throw his opponents off. Regardless, this is still a great deck to play. Great at flooding the board with the help of Kana and pushing damage with the help of Sorla. On top of that, it has additional reach with trebuchets, unsupervised artilleries, and Uglody Vandals. The color combination might seem a bit unorthodox at first, but you get to play Annihilation and Coup de Grasse and still hit their tower hard. What else could you ask for? Now, we move on to the standouts. These are the players who brought the decks that no one else had in the top 16, but their experience and card selection pushed through even the most unfavorable matchups. Firstly, Swim's Mono Blue. This is not your run-of-the-mill Mono Blue, employing the never-seen Outworld Devourer instead of Skyrath Mage. As Swim said on Twitter, quote, Skyrath Mage blows, honestly. You can see where he's coming from. Skyrath Mage has 6 health, causing it to die pretty easily to most things, like at any cost. Also, Mystic Flare can be clunky and not present good situations to have it used well. Whereas Outworld Devourer, on the other hand, seems solid for this tournament meta. 7 health and a signature card that does a great job blocking your opponent from playing cards. The blue color generally doesn't have access to Silence or Stun. This is why initially, blue paired well with Drow Ranger. However, for Mono Blue, Astral Imprisonment fills that role. It is also quite flexible in that it can protect your blue heroes from dying to those pesky duels and ganks. The passive of restoring 2 mana to play additional cards is just an added bonus. The rest of the deck is the standard mono blue build except Swim removed 1 at any cost to make it a 43 card deck instead of his popularized 44, and replaced Glyph of Confusion for Lost in Time. Because while Jasper Daggers can't be Glyph, it can't be cards locked in your hand for 3 turns. Our second standout and final deck for today is Super JJ's Red Blue Control. This deck gives up a little on consistency to combine the mid-range power of Mono Red with the board clearing ability of Mono Blue. Super JJ played this deck in groups and stuck with it for top 16. This was our favorite deck present. Super JJ tweaked the deck a bit to fit his opponents, but it is mostly the same as we have seen before. The general idea of this deck is to pressure the early game with your powerful creeps without giving up in any lane. And then you can finish your opponent off with Time of Triumph as usual. If you ever end up behind in a lane, then annihilate. Routed finds the most use in this deck because you can consistently have three or more of your opponent's heroes in the fountain. Super JJ also teched in a Vesture of the Tyrant to beat the aggressive decks and to get his heroes back in the fight if they are caught in the crossfire of a board wipe. Your other items are pretty cheap, so only one expensive item like Vesture is fine. All in all, this was an awesome tournament. A healthy and diverse constructed meta combined with the excellent production and organization from the Wii Play team. The open qualifiers enabled some new faces to be seen, which is very important to keep the game growing and the tournaments interesting. Let us know what your favorite deck in the tournament was, or a favorite moment you had. Like if you enjoyed, and subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.